um, alcohol fuel, 1% back then. Now, we've had a huge push for uh, alcohol fuel. There have been two big bubbles that have broken, two big hopes. Uh, one of them was the uh, hydrogen economy. You don't hear very many people talking about it anymore. I think it's probably sunk in that hydrogen is not free for the having. There's no place you can go, like you can go for coal or gas or oil and drill a hole or, and, and get uh, hydrogen. You get hydrogen by using one energy source, using another energy source to create the hydrogen. You split water or you with electricity or you get it from natural gas, but you will always use more energy getting the hydrogen than you will get out of the hydrogen. That's the second law of thermodynamics. And if we, we can violate that law, why we can set aside the law of gravity and then we won't have the kind of problems we have today with energy, will we? That's an inviolate law that won't change. So why are we talking about hydrogen? If you will never get as much energy out of the hydrogen as it took to make the hydrogen, for two reasons. One, when you finally burn it, the product you get is the oxide of hydrogen. It's burned hydrogen. We call it water. When you look at water, it's burned hydrogen is what it is. And that's really clean, isn't it? And the second thing is it's a great candidate for a fuel cell, which is probably at least two decades off. So you don't hear much talk about hydrogen. It may one day be an important part of our energy economy. But that day must await, I think, the development of, of uh, uh, the, the fuel cell. Because if you're simply going to put hydrogen in a reciprocating engine, why wouldn't you put the, the fuel from which you made the hydrogen in your reciprocating energy, uh, reciprocating engine and save that fuel loss in, 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 in the transition? The second big bubble that, that broke was the corn ethanol bubble. And I really had high hopes for this before I did some back of the envelope computations. Um, because I saw our farmers who were getting too little for their crops, huge energy representing these crops as being able, and I think they will, make a meaningful contribution to our energy future. But not the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, dimensions that were anticipated for um, uh, corn ethanol. The National Academy of Sciences, and this isn't Roscoe Bartlett, this is National Academy of Sciences, although my back of the envelope computations came to the same conclusion. The National Academy of Sciences says if we use all of our corn for ethanol, every bit of it, use all of it for ethanol, and discounted it for the fossil fuel input, which is huge. In fact, some people believe that if you really cost account all the fossil fuel energy that goes into producing ethanol, more energy goes in than you get out of it. They were using 80%, which is probably not bad. Uh, that that would displace 2.4% of our gasoline. That's all of our corn displaced 2.4% of our gasoline. They noted wryly that you could save as much gas if you tuned up your car and put air in the tires. And by the way, you would save half your gas if there was two people in every vehicle out there instead of one, which is in most vehicles. You would save half your gas if your vehicle got, got 40 miles per gallon rather than 20 miles per gallon, both of which are very doable with a little planning and buying the right, the right car, by the way. I think it was two or three days ago, there was a major headline above the fold in the New York Times saying that third world leaders were complaining to us that we were starving their people because the high price of corn incented our farmers to shift land from wheat and soybeans to corn. That drove up the price of wheat and soybeans. There have been some problems producing rice around the world. And anyway, these commodities tend to move together. So the four basic foods of the poorest people in the world, they said, have been driven up drastically, essentially doubled in price, because we're making corn ethanol. Hyman Rickover, by the way, I don't have that quote here. But please, do a Google search for, for Rickover and energy speech, and it'll pop up. He cautioned that you probably shouldn't be eating your food. 51 years ago, maybe we should have listened. Geothermal, that's true geothermal. That's not hooking your heat pump to ground temperature, which is a really good idea. If you think about what you're asking that heat pump to do this winter, if it wasn't hooked to ground temperature, you were asking it to cool the outside air, which might have been 10 degrees, so that it could warm up your air in the house. That's what you're doing. How much? 
its job would have been if it had been looking at 56 degrees rather than 10 degrees because 56 degrees is what ground temperature in here it's mean annual temperature it's what the water is that comes out of the wells now this summer if you have an air conditioner in your window and it's not a heat pump tied to the ground what that air conditioner is going to be trying to do is heating up the 100 degree air outside so it can cool your house inside pretty tough job but if you had tied that air conditioner to to ground temperature now it's looking at 56 which looks really cool compared to 100 doesn't it i didn't understand this phenomenon as a uh, as a seven-year-old and uh, i grew up without electricity and an inside toilet on a farm and we kept our food uh in a spring house and i thought there was something magic in that spring house i didn't understand it but i knew it was magic because i went in that spring house in the summertime and it was so cool and I went in that spring house in the winter time and it was so warm. Of course, when it was 100 outside, that spring house, which was maybe 65, that was Pennsylvania, would be a little colder than here, maybe uh, uh, 60 or so, that really seemed cool. In the winter time, 60 seemed really warm compared to the zero or 10 uh, degrees outside. So I thought there was something magic in that greenhouse. Uh, the next chart takes a little uh, a deeper look at some of our um, alternatives. Now, we do have some finite resources. And we can exploit those, and we will exploit those, and we should exploit those. But they are finite. They are not forever. But some of them are huge. The first of these are the uh, tar sands in, in uh, Canada. They are huge. There's as much potential oil in those tar sands as there is in all of the known reserves of oil in the world. More, actually. So why aren't we euphoric over that. It's because it's very difficult to get. The Canadians are now using natural gas, which will run out. They're pumping water, which will run out. They're creating a huge tailings pond, which is kind of an environmental disaster, and they're producing a million barrels a day. That's a lot. It's a little over 1% of what the world uses. We use about 80 8 million barrels a day. But they know it's not sustainable because they're going to run out of gas, they're going to run out of water, and what they're now exploiting is kind of on the surface and it will soon kind of duck under an overlay so they'll have to develop it in situ and they aren't quite sure how to do that. So there's a huge amount of energy there, potential. But there's also a huge amount of potential energy in the tides. The moon lifts the whole darned ocean, two or three feet, that's a huge amount of energy. But, you know, getting that in your gas tank is quite another thing. Energy to be effective must be concentrated in the tides. It certainly isn't concentrated. Now, in our west, we have oil shales. And they are really huge, maybe even bigger than the tar sands in Canada. Nobody yet is commercially exploiting those. There are some vigorous attempts today, and there may be some exploitation of those. There's at least a trillion barrels, maybe a trillion and a half, two trillion barrels there. Um, and different experts differ on how much of that may be recoverable. But again, because it's there, it's not in your gas tank, we will recover some of that. As oil goes up, Goldman Sachs said by the end of the year, it could be $150, $200 a barrel. Who knows? The more expensive oil gets, the more sources there are of oil because you can now use oil which would have been prohibitive in cost with oil at lower uh, prices.